What's going on, everybody? Thanks again for tuning in today to this episode of The Schwag. This is episode three, and today we are being joined by Dr. Robert Poole. He is a, a family medicine practitioner, and uh, he's just he works and consults in the cannabis industry. And uh, just want to give him a warm welcome. How you doing, Dr. Robbie? I'm doing good. How you doing? I'm doing great, man. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, man. So uh, I know that the uh, the cannabis industry in Pennsylvania is growing, and uh, you've been involved in that. But I kind of want to just start ab out about like um, where you're from and a little bit about your background. Okay. I'm based in from Connecticut, in New Haven, Connecticut. Came to uh, Philadelphia to um, study medicine at Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine. Um, completed my residency and been in private practice doing primarily for about 18, 19 years now. Um, oh, that's amazing. And happy in a private practice and doing basic, but looking to explore other avenues of medicine and healthcare for patients um, with um, chronic health conditions or for any, um, med any additional medicational help that we can do for some of our patients. Um, any therapeutics that we can add to what they've already been utilizing in their um, normal care, the uh, conditions that they both they go through. That's cool. Yeah. yeah, man, it's always it's always great when you when you meet uh, a doctor of color, another a black man who's a, a medical professional. Uh, what what made you decide to uh, get into medicine? Uh, I, I don't think I had any other thought and what I was planning on doing for, since I was about in kindergarten, I always wanted to do, always wanted to be a doctor. And I always wanted to um, help people. And it kind of like um, through the years and, and high school and through life, that desire just kept growing from having parents and family members that were sick or had um, medical conditions that I just wanted to give more to help for. Um, looking at the community, um, I volunteered in the hospital when I was like in high school. And so a lot of um, minority patients, um, not filling most of the hospital in Connecticut and New Haven was a lot of um, minority patients and they weren't receiving the healthcare that I felt that was they can able to identify with. And I wanted to be able to identify with my community, explain what their care should be and to make sure that they receive uh, the appropriate best care that they can get. And, the only way to do that was to be into the field myself and to become knowledgeable and able to um, communicate with those patients at the same time. And that's what drove me to the final decision to go to medical school. Gotcha. Now, yeah, uh, there's been a lot of stories about uh, the disparities in healthcare coming out recently, um, especially ones that affect uh, Black women uh, during like pregnancy and that sort of thing and how they're so, perceived by the medical professionals. Uh, so that that's really important. We do need a lot of uh, black doctors and nurses. Definitely. You know, that's essentially where I want to go back into my community and give the most that I can give. And it ended up being primary care that I felt needed to be addressed in our community because those were where the people lacked and where they didn't understand why they needed to see a doctor on a regular basis until they had a major problem that had to be addressed by a specialist. Right. Yeah, so actually like one of the, uh, growing up I did have a, a few black doctors, but like one of the ones who made the most impact on me, believe it or not, was a fictional doctor, Dr. Huxtable, <laughs> <laughs> Bill Cosby. He's not seen in the best light today, but he was one of like, one of my idols back then, um, especially because I wanted to enter into media and present like positive images like doctors and um, his wife was a lawyer and that sort of thing. So I think it's very important, especially for the younger generation to see themselves reflected in the professional atmosphere. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. And you can see that they can do it exactly right. Most of my practice has been mostly children. So that's what I'm, figure I'm making the impact right there um, to let them know that uh, you can see a black man of color doing something else, you know, and they can see that they can achieve and what they want to do in life at the same point, you know. And they come back and talk and 
say, how was college and what did you major in and what did you do? And when I have even comments about not going, you don't have to go to college, but you need to do something. And right. we can have a conversation as well, you know? That's great. So that's pretty impressive. Well, a lot of the things you're saying, I can tell that you're very patient focused and uh, I can see uh, how you kind of transitioned into this growing field of uh, these new treatments with uh, medical cannabis and using cannabis as a therapy. Uh, what made you kind of decide that you wanted to um, start exploring that? You know, looking for other avenues for therapeutics for patients. I had patients, my one mom came in telling me that her, patient, her son was already, um, who is autistic, was already on medical marijuana. And I didn't know that she had started and asking her what the response was being and how he was doing. And knowing that I, as a physician, should be more aware and more um, focused on what was going on and what he was using and looking for other effects of that he might have been um, experiencing on it, I decided that I needed to um, um, investigate and to and further my education into what medical marijuana could be, as well as for some of the patients that have had um, cancer therapies or um, arthritis therapies and were on medication maxed out. Um, I felt that I needed to experiment and see what other type of avenues that these patients could explore or refer them to the receive. And during that process of um, doing that, I became certified in medical marijuana myself um, so that I could at least um, consult those patients and tell them what possibly things that they could do in the same time. Gotcha. Now, was that a part of like being relicensed or was that like a continuing education type thing for you? It was a continued education. It was a continued education. I think I can't remember. We had to do a number of hours um, of um, training initially um, and then take a test afterwards to, to basically um, reinforce that your knowledge of what you had just experienced and learned. Um, in the same time afterwards, I've been investigating, doing a lot of research on it as well before I even like it. And it probably integrated into the uh, medical marijuana field, even in certifying patients. Okay. Did you have, did you initially have any reservations about doing it because of any stigmas or anything like that? No reservations, you know, initially in the beginning, you know, in talking to a lot of my adolescent patients who were utilizing marijuana to, as I said, focus or doing things in college and in school, and they needed it to relax. I talked about other avenues they can utilize to relax or focus. Um, and they were coming back and telling me, and it was a little bit difficult um, telling patients not to utilize marijuana recreationally mm -hmm. um, when a lot of the states have already legalized marijuana uh, for those same patients that I'm telling not to use, use it in order to and use other avenues. I needed to know what they were receiving, what kind of um, benefits they were receiving from it that might um, improve in their focus, improve in what their relaxation techniques were. Um, and that was one of the reasons I investigated the field as well. Um, I had a lot of patients um, who have had um, patients' mothers, patients' grandmothers, because um, a lot of my practice is family-oriented, um, who've had um, cancer and have cancer therapies. I've had patients who were poly, you know, HIV, who had um, a lot of pain management um, problems. I had patients who had rheumatoid arthritis and seeing them maximized out on the medication but not benefit, benefiting from what they were utilizing at the same time. Um, family members that had had cancer, my father and my sister, um, both went through uh, tons of pain with um, cancer treatments. Um, and never had the opportunity to investigate other avenues for therapy when they were going through their pain. Okay, so when you say uh, max out on medication, you mean the traditional medicines they're taking as much as they can? Right, yes. Or the okay. side effects is I'm not taking that medication because um, it makes me nauseous. I'm not going to take that medication because I feel like I'm um, 
not able to move or I'm not going to get up and move, it reduces my ability to focus or it um, makes me uncomfortable utilizing and going about the rest of my day. And those were the responses I got from patients. Well, I'm not going to take any more of that because it just doesn't help me. And I've been taking this medication. I have patients' mothers who came in who, who were very concerned about their kids, but who were being treated for um, severe cancer or for a rheumatoid arthritis or other lupus and were on medications, yet um, felt like they had to, um, couldn't take the medication because they had to take care of their children because once they took the medication, they couldn't focus on what was going on with the kids. Um, and they were in tons of pain or, or inability to move or, mold, or get around. And it was just an avenue for recommendation with other therapies have they tried. You know. Gotcha. Now, um, going through your research and your continuing education and being certified in uh, medical cannabis, were there any uh, like preconceived notions that you had that were either proven to be true or uh, maybe uh, uh, disproven? You know, um, the only, it was never for medical marijuana, but for more for the recreational use of marijuana. Um, as an um, African-American man, um, I had problems with um, my adolescents utilizing marijuana um, in our communities because they put them at risk for doing, um, put them in situations where they may not be able to realize they're doing something they should not be doing and put them at risk for possibly being um, identified as causing problems elsewhere. Right. And um, for the recreational use of marijuana, I've always recommended for both my um, African males or African-American female teenagers and adult college students that you have to be um, mindful of who do you're utilizing marijuana with, what types of marijuana you're getting it from, because um, there's not always um, what you think you have, which may have um, adverse effects. Um, you have to be um, mindful that you're going to be identified with a group of people who are utilizing drugs and the police or law enforcement are not going to see you as I see you as knowing you as an intelligent, um, competent, um, focused individual that you may at that point in time make wrong decisions based on who you're with because of the effects of the marijuana. And that was my basic effect or ability to um, understand the recreation and the use of marijuana. So I think that my negative effects thoughts were reduced once I took the course and understood the medical marijuana effects of uh, marijuana or cannabis. You know? Gotcha. That's cool. Well, speaking of, speaking of that, you know, there are so many uh, myths and urban legends about cannabis. And I know people really want to know, and maybe the, the science is still not out there, but maybe you can help us with some of the things that you might know, or maybe that you have learned. Um, I, I did hear though that um, early use of cannabis can possibly trigger uh, psychosis or schizophrenia. Um, have you found or read any studies about that? There is studies that say that the use of um, cannabis, if you have a predisposition or family history of psychosis or schizophrenia can magnify that effect. That's, def that's indefinite. Um, that's not been, uh, and as part of, um, I guess you signed a waiver if there's a history. I think that's one of the things I've always asked patients. Is there any family history of um, psychiatric issue illness? And then we explore what type of psychiatric illness there was. But schizophrenia and is one of the biggest ones that may be cause a predisposition toward with the use of um, marijuana. Okay. And uh, I have seen patients, now I can't say that there was recreational marijuana or, or the synthetic marijuana that's been in the population of K2 that, um, college students who were fine in high school and went to college and 
smoked the marijuana, which I did not know, did reverted to uh, pretty strong schizophrenia uh, effects after utilizing it. Man, I that was medical cool. marijuana, but I, we don't know what exactly, and we still haven't come to a conclusion what was actually um, they utilized. Got you. Now, uh, since there's still a lot of people purchasing uh, uh, cannabis on the black market, is, are there any studies about the effects on those patients, on people who consume that type of cannabis versus uh, the the regulated cannabis? No, I haven't seen any of those studies. Okay. Those. All right. For the for the guys out there or people in um, who are thinking about family planning, <laughs> there's always been this myth that uh, cannabis consumption can affect your sperm count. Have you heard anything about that? Once well, so during adolescence, it can. They say that it can cause um, some degree of testicular atrophy. Um, mm which I do um, um, notify most of my own teenage patients that are coming and adolescent patients that come in that in development of t t testicular growth that cannabis has, has a history of them causing um, some degree of testicular atrophy. Okay. Gotcha. Um, yeah, I got, I got like maybe like six more of these things. Do you, do you, have you seen any studies about, uh, how consumption of cannabis can affect your fitness or your muscle recovery? I haven't seen that at all. I haven't seen those studies. That'd be interesting to me. I can't even comment on that one. Might be interesting though. Yeah, I know a lot of athletes. How utilizing it. Wonder, I wonder how to utilize them, whether if they're um, vaping it versus using oral medication or topical medication. Vaping may cause some degree of, um, I'm thinking, you know, respiratory, you know, decline a little bit as well. And that may decrease if you're thinking about, um, you know, cardio, that that's going to probably definitely decrease um, the ability for you to um, increase your cardio. I don't know about muscular growth or anything. I have not read on that. Okay. And well, speaking of that, uh, what would you say would be the, the safest way to consume cannabis? If you're a medical patient, it depends on how you, you need to utilize it. You know, um, if it's um, a patient with um, with arthritis or pain relief, you may you may want to add you, topicals. Or tinctures may be um, the way to go. It may not be as fast acting as um, vaping or inhalation. Um, Again, the edibles, again, those, those that are going to be like a delayed reaction as well, but there'll be a prolonged reaction. Um, it depends on what is needed for each individual patient. Okay. Now, can you become addicted to cannabis? They say no, that you can't become addicted, but um, your threshold for need may increase as time goes on, but you can't get addicted to it. Okay. And... What would be some of the uh, the health concerns that people should have if they're deciding that uh, cannabis might be a treatment they want to consider? You know, um, you have to know that definitely you can't. Um, you shouldn't be operating heavy machinery during the utilization of it. Um, driving motor vehicles, um, you have to make sure that you know you don't have any history. If you're going to be vaping, any history of um, COPD, um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease that may have affected the lungs. Um, Got to make sure that if you're doing a position or where you have to have more focus, that some jobs you know, are not going to, no matter whether you have a license to utilize the um, medical marijuana or not, are not going to be able to employ you, secondary to the fact that they need someone that is not under the influence to do drug testing still. Mm. Um, so there's nothing uh, to prevent employers from from uh, drug testing you uh, well, in of, Pennsylvania. No, if it's part of their own um, protocol, they can't. You can't. Um, you can't. Even you can tell them that you have the um, license, and they can decide whether they're going to um, employ you or not. Okay. Yeah. So for those of you who uh, want to get the bag, that's something that you definitely need to consider. 
Uh, yeah, that's that's really important. Uh, so what 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 are you what type of um, ailments are you treating cannabis with right now? In Pen Pennsylvania, we treat um, chronic pain, um, intractable seizures, um, HIV, cancer patients, um, anxiety. Is um, primarily, in, and I know it's one of the criteria here in Pennsylvania, but not in other states like New Jersey. I don't think anxiety is one of our um, criteria. Um, those are the big ones that I can think of automatically. Um, and now, is it more so if, uh, for pain management with opioid like opioid. cancer and, uh, and HIV? Yeah. Opioid abuse a lot is in Pennsylvania because they're trying to um, reduce the use of opioids as well. Okay. That's another one that's um, pretty um, multifactorial here in Pennsylvania. Gotcha. Uh, how, are, uh, how are the medical professionals determining the dosage? Because if you're smoking it versus vaping it or dabbing or even an edible uh, for the average person is kind of hard to determine, you know, how okay. much you can take. Yeah, that's a difficult one. Most, yeah. of, most of the medical professionals all were, were as physicians is basically approving that you have a medical diagnosis that um, allows you to um, use medical marijuana. Um, at that point, we refer you to a pharmacist at one of the um, institutions that will provide you with the medical marijuana and they'll go through um, a talk with you and discuss what you need to receive it for and they'll tailor the um, medical marijuana to your needs. Okay. Um, at some point they can tell you we need the upper or we might want to change it to a different um, composition um, to see if that'll assist you. There's times when you need um, ability to relax and they need to give you something that's going to be able to help you relax a little bit more or versus something that'll help you be a little bit more alert. But that's usually done through the uh, pharmacists who determine what kind of effects that then patients need to receive from the utilization. Okay. So would, would you happen to know, like, is, is there actually a difference between uh, indicas and sativas? Oh, there's definitely a difference. Yeah, <laughs> some, of them are, some of them are, those medications, well, some of them will help you to relax more. Some will help you be a little bit more alert and focused. And um, the pharmacists go through at any time the patient comes in, what they individually need to receive from each of those. You know, do you need to be a little bit more focused and a little bit more alert? Or do you, is your pain keeping you up at night that you need to um, be a little bit more relaxed and more um, sleep so that you can get through and focus more so during the day when, when you're not utilizing the medical marijuana. Got you. Okay. So yeah, uh, someone told me that uh, indica, you can uh, mem remember its effect by uh, saying in the couch <laughs> and, and uh, sativas kind of keep you alert. So mm -hmm. I, I wanted to know if that was true. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. And there's, yeah. there's different there's tons of different types of um, compositions. Now, Doc, what's the biggest difference between uh, CBD and THC? Uh, that's like a hard question. CBD doesn't have to carry any of the um, marijuana THC products that cause the um, that's the part that gets tested in your um, drug test for one, but cause you any of the um, portions that are going to get you to a level that's um, more um, reduce your um, focus or your ability to uh, concentrate. CBD more so is for mostly for its pain relief on a generalized level. Some people do get a lot of relief from the CBD itself. Um, I know a lot of patients just using CBD oils try to get more relief. CBD itself, supposedly, if you're taking it at 
mimics the normal circadian rhythm as well. So that if you're like um, um, taking it in the evening, it helps you to relax. Suppose it during the day that it increases your ability to focus and be alert. Those are the two things. With the THC itself, um, it's pretty focused on what it's going to do. Gotcha. So, well, you really helping me out, Doc, because my, my grandfather is experiencing some health issues and I tried to sell him on it, but uh, he's an old school conservative Jamaican. Oh. Thanks to that. Oh, no, that's for Rastas. I'm like, no, there's, there's actually some medical benefits that could help you. I've seen, so I've seen some patients that are older who have been through pain and they tried a lot of medications and they're ready and willing to try anything. I've never seen older patients that are not even interested in, in their own. It means that the pain hasn't been into that point where they're not able to, um, to manage it and to get through. So I think that he's okay at this point, then probably. Yeah. <laughs> he's probably a strong man. <laughs> <laughs> well, how, how uh, for patients who are thinking about cannabis as a therapy, how can they learn more about it? There's tons of um, websites on it. I don't have them. Um, available right now to prayer for all that one. Um, but there's tons of websites. It goes through all the tons of um, the therapeutics there are, the different types of medical marijuana there are, what might be um, effective on for what their problems were, um, who to um, contact, whether they need to um, discuss the issues more with a medical marijuana physician or organization. There's um, numerous places that they can um, online um, find the areas that, that they need to um, access. And in all the areas in all in Pennsylvania, I know that there's tons of, in every county, there's um, physicians that they can contact. Okay. Are, are you uh, working in Pennsylvania and New Jersey or just Pennsylvania? Pennsylvania. Okay. And so since um, the industry has become, or the therapy has become available, um, are you are you seeing a lot of resistance from physicians in the medical field? Or are you seeing more people kind of um, accept this as a as a way to treat patients? It, it, it's the additive acceptance. You know, most physicians understand that it's something that um, adds to the benefit of the patients. Um, as being physicians, we we don't want to give something that's going to cause a problem with the patients. So therefore, we're not all physicians are going to recommend it as an avenue. They may recommend that you go see one and discuss that if we've explored all avenues of um, therapy, but you're not going to get all physicians that are licensed to, to do um, certified patients. Um, most physicians now understand that it is an additive effect to most of the therapies that they can use. Um, for most of our medical conferences, there have always been some type of um, lectures or information provided on the use of medical marijuana. Now, yeah, I'm starting to see, like, uh, since it's become, I guess, kind of decriminalized and legalized, there's so many uh, different stores and mom and pop shops that are selling CBD or uh, claiming that they're selling a product that's CBD. Do you have any reservations about people trying that stuff? I do because there's no um, federally um, designated um, site that controls CBD. Um, we can never determine how much is in one product versus another product. Um, what your benefits are going to be from this or whether there's too high of a level, there's no, um, criteria that federal department of um, public health as well as um, um, pharmacists don't provide information. So that's over the counter, like a lot of um, different medications that we don't um, look at and, and focus on. So we can't really recommend that you use that because of the fact that it's not been federally um, investigated and there's no specific dose so you can buy something that has no CBD in it versus something that has way too much CBD in it. And we don't have any idea on what you're going to be purchasing. Okay. Yeah, that that's, uh, I, I see them all the time, man. And it, it's, it's so funny. Because I'm like, wait, shouldn't you be getting this from like a pharmacist or something or from a dispensary? Right. But yeah, yeah. 
They sell it anywhere. It's the new craze. I've seen it infused in drinks and foods. It's uh it's the new mir it's the new miracle uh drug, I guess you could say. What's one of the most craziest claims that you've heard uh that cannabis or C B D or THC could treat? Or most far out there? I haven't really, you know, from listening to the patients that I've seen, I haven't had most of the patients that have come in have all talked about and brought medical records because I don't make the diagnosis of what um, medical problem they have. I basically have looked at what their medical records from past physicians have been. Um, so in, in order to make the criteria count, they have to um, have demonstrated that they've been treated for other problems, those problems on the list with other natural therapies, if it's physical therapy versus um, pain management versus um, massage. Um, some people have recommended like, um, you know, like yoga or stretching for pain. Um, but they've, nobody really has come in for, I, I know that it treats this and I need this um, medication or prescribe for that because that's just not how it's going to you're not going to get certified for that. You know? I have patients, most of the patients just tell me it helps them to relax. They don't tell me much more. It helps me relax and it helps me focus. I said, how do you study with them utilizing a marijuana? It helps me to focus. But uh, if you feel that it does, then okay, there's other ways that you can focus and we can go through it, but because it's not utilized for that portion, well, fine. You know, we'll do the research and we'll assist them. There's a, like some patients that are thinking about using with them attention deficit hyperactivity disorder hyperactivity disorder uh, but I haven't seen most any patients come in with that diagnosis that have utilized it and told me that they have received success from that. Okay it, are there any patients that you would suggest avoid um, consuming cannabis or consuming it in a certain type of way like maybe if they have any pulmonary issues or any heart problems? Mostly just what you call them. If they're on medications that may um, be augmented, because some medications may um, cause the elevation of their um, heart medications or their pulmonary medications, then we worry about them utilizing medical marijuana. Um, patients, like I said before, with COPD or chronic lung conditions may have problems with them utilizing vaping marijuana. If they want to utilize marijuana, maybe have to be tinctures or some other form of um, marijuana. Um, you have to make sure that their medications are not affected by the level of marijuana and may adversely have an effect on the patient that may be detrimental. Definitely. Well, thank you. That, that was some really great information. I kind of want to uh, shift gears as as we wrap this up and just ask, um, how are you working in the industry currently? Right now, what you call I'm doing, mostly doing research. I mean, we'll be back and doing certifications shortly. Um, I was doing certifications for patients um, with chronic conditions, but we'll be probably doing again more certifications in, in the near future. Right now, uh, recommending patients for to seek out uh, medical marijuana as an avenue for additional therapy for their medical problems is where I'm saying again. Okay. Now, if someone wanted to go about obtaining a prescription or a cannabis card, how, how would they go about that and how long is that process? You can go look on the um, Department of Public Health. They have a list of um, medical marijuana physicians that can do the certify, certification. Most patients have to come in there with your medical records. Most people come in there and say they have a diagnosis of anxiety. It's not going to get you a certification. You have to have had a diagnosis of anxiety made by um, a physician or psychiatrist in the past. Utilization of other medication that needs to see that you had either positive or negative effect from those medication is another criteria. Um, there's patients with um, chronic pain, we have to see that there's been a history of what you treated for, what was the pain related to, was it um, treated with physical therapy, had surgery been performed, which was not um, helpful for the patients. Um, 
pain levels um, for patients that have HIV, that they're on other medications as well, not just taking medical marijuana to treat their symptoms. Um, you have to have those diagnoses. Um, patients just can't walk in and say that I have anxiety or depression or pain and expect to be certified without having them filed a file protocol. Okay. All right, Doc. Well, thanks a lot for your time today. We really appreciate you. I all thank right. you for all the information you provided. Um, and yeah, it was a really great conversation. I, I really enjoyed it. All righty. Have thanks a good a lot, one. man. Okay, take care.